Okay, well, welcome to everybody. Here am I. I'm in Manchester, north of uh, England, and it's been a bit of a cold winter's day. So, welcome to all of you from wherever you are around the planet. This is just the most amazing uh, opportunity that's been put forward, and I'm delighted to be part of it. So, tonight, or whatever time of day it is with you, I'm going to be taking you through this model of happiness that I've come up with and uh, give you a chance to explore it. Now, I've never done this before. I'm a, I'm a novice, so treat me gently. And if I speak too quickly, please tell me, because I get quite excited and I will probably speak too much, too quickly. Happiness, happiness. Aristotle would have it that happiness is the meaning and the purpose of life, the whole aim and the end of human existence. So he has something in common with the uh, beauty queens, pageant queens, who want world peace and happiness for all. It's not a bad thing. It, uh, it gets the world to go around. And I came to this way of uh, thinking as a, as a desire to, to find out what are the causes of happiness and have a look at that, have a look at some of the states that let us know where we are in terms of feeling happy and, and clues to let us know when we're not happy. To lead us then to find out what are the components of happiness. This is the model that's emerged. And out of that, how can you use this model? How can you work with this model so that you can be at cause, you can engineer the level of happiness that you're looking for? I first came into this um, because someone must have spoken to our Prime Minister that happiness is a good thing for the nation. And he set about doing a survey to find out how happy we are as a, as, as a country. The thinking behind it being is that happy people tend to be healthier. They tend to um, positively affect the, the, the society, the group, the culture they're in. And then potentially, therefore, they are more productive, they have fewer days off work. And the, so there were some debates into what was the contributing factors of happiness. And there was a television forum. And everyone was going on about what they thought was uh, the reason. So good housing, um, good, reduced crime rates, uh, in, in good schooling. Um, family, um, lack of family upheaval, all these things were being put forward. Also being put forward was uh, diet and exercise. You know, if you exercise, you're going to get the endorphins and they're going to make you happy. Or if you happen to eat things like salmon, spinach and turkey, which has more serotonin in it, you're going to up your feelings of well-being. Hmm. Then there's a, those who think that uh, happiness is a, a chemical thing. So in terms of medication, if you yeah, if your serotonin levels chemically, you're going to become happier. There are others who will say, let go of your worldly goods. Um, focus on mindfulness and you will be, become happy. You will tap into that rich scene. And there's others who say, well, do you know what? There's some people for whom the glass is half empty. There's some people for whom the glass is half full. You know, it's kind of the nature of the way you were born, whether you're going to be happy or not. And I'm hearing all of these things, and I'm going to, I don't believe this. This is not what I subscribe to. And I'm kind of with Thomas Jefferson. Your people feel about as happy as they make up their minds to be, which is another way of saying, we are at cause and we're not at effect, which is music for NLP's ears. So, this is interesting because I had these all nicely uh, to be revealed, but you're getting them all in a one The interesting thing is that happiness is a state. So, if you ask yourself, how do I know I'm happy? How do I know I'm not happy? Well, you're likely, if you're not happy, uh, to be feeling in the present a sense of being unsettled, dissatisfied, um, depressed. And 
term James introduced me to the notion that there are some states, some emotions which are past referenced and some emotions which are future referenced. So if we're experiencing things like regret, resentment, loss, guilt, anger or shame, these will be because of events that have happened in the past. Conversely, if we're feeling disquiet, anxiety, foreboding, fear, then that's because we're anticipating events that are going to happen in the future. With both of these, we are not in the present. And I don't know whether you've experienced Judith Pelosier's work on I keeping somebody in the present and how difficult that is because you will see from the individual's physiology that even you know the eye movement and they've gone to something ref uh, remembered or constructed or just a wee shift in the shoulders can indicate that off center that the person has moved from being completely here in the present to one or other of the past or future. Interesting. So if we're wanting now to explore happiness and that state of being in the present, then we need to have an awareness of what the past and the future might be. So if you take a look at this, this is what I'm suggesting, that in the present we may feel a sense of being at ease or we may have a sense of contentment or we may have a sense of happiness. There could also be a sense of ecstasy or bliss. Now, personally, I'll just go for happiness. The idea of living in ecstasy or bliss is too exhausting. Uh, I'm sure I'd burn out, although maybe I'm underachieving. I don't know. I think I've spoken to a lot of people and they often will talk about just feeling contented. And I'm wondering, do you know, maybe we just could up our game a bit. Maybe people could ask for that bit more to move from bobbing along at contentment and getting surges and more consistent surges of happiness. Happiness and that real sense of well-being. And when we're in that place, we can look at our past and we will find ourselves with words like, fulfillment, achievement, satisfaction, a sense of completion, a sense of reconciliation with what has been. And we'll view our future with hope and expectation and anticipation and excitement. Now, I don't know, as, as you're looking at these words and evaluating them, where they are for you in terms of how much do you have that sense of completion or are you still um, bedeviled by senses of anger or sadness or shame? Do you, in your terms of view of the future, is it giving a sense of fear or foreboding or anxiety or are you in that expectation, hope, anticipation? It's interesting. And of course, it'll change its, its context. It'll change in terms of what's happening to us and, and who we're with. But what I'm talking about is looking for something with a sustained default, a sustained level of optimum operating. OK. Now, if anyone's got any questions at any point, please type them in or please put your hand up. And, I think I've got the technology to manage that. All right, I'm going to man go into now the idea of the, the model. Before I do, I'd just like to offer you uh, my definition of a model and the purpose of a model. Uh, for me, the purpose of a model is to simplify the complex. Um, for those of you who've done modeling, for those of you who produce models, you'll know that we have to work towards reducing it down. And in that model, there is contained the, the essence of arguably a very complex system. However, in its reduction, 
it becomes accessible, consumable, uh, doable. It seems valid. It seems something that we can manage for ourselves. Another thing about a model is it should help us know where we are. So, for example, if you take the neurological levels as a, as a model, then we are able to go either I realize I'm speaking, I am speaking at, uh, in that instance, uh, I'm speaking is it's at a credit, uh, capability level, I'm speaking on or something I'm doing. doing. Um, I should be able to go, this person's talking from their beliefs level. This is not a, a behavioral thing, this is beliefs. So because I've got access to these different levels, I can work my way in finding out what is going on. So I hope with the model I'm offering you tonight, it'll help you know where you are in this territory of uh, thing called happiness. A good model should also expand our awareness. It should also be able to take us to potentially corners of our experience that we haven't been to before, or let us go further down into the fractals of detail within those areas. A good model to allow us to gain insight and to equip us to go forward and to do something different, to do something more. And another factor of a good model is to enable acquisition by others. So the model needs to be portable. It should be able to be, as you know, acquired by somebody else in a way that is simple and uncumbersome. So the acquisition process uh, should, should seek to be universal. So these are some of my rules for model construction. And I just ask you if what you're about to get meets those rules. So here we go. This is the model. And first of all, and I'm gonna I'm gonna walk through it, uh, showing it to you all in a one is is fine. Uh, however, I'm gonna start off with security. Now, security here in, in the present, we need to feel that we have a sense of physical security, literally. It's, it's Maslow's hierarchy, that we have got a um, roof over our head, that we have health. It may be financial security. It may be in terms of social security. It may be a certain uh, status, perhaps, even. Now, for a lot of people, they will work very hard and see it as the purpose of their life to gain that sense of security. And what I'm going to suggest here is that we probably need less than we think we need. And this pursuit may be that we're using up viable energy in endeavors that actually don't serve us that they don't fulfill a need that we have, they don't fulfill that that's something that we want. And it's up to us to question just how much security do I need? The next one to look at is a big one. I mean, security is a huge one, but the next one is acceptance. And that's about looking at the past and going, it's happened. We had a TV show here, it was a satirical sort of comedy show, and it was called That Was The Week That Was, and the song that went with it was, That Was The Week That Was, It's Over, Let It Go. And you'll see there, the little sort of sound bite there, the chuck it, chuck it phrase there. And this came because I was at a conference uh, doing this workshop, and there was a wonderful woman, a wonderful woman participant, who had already made it known of her lesson from thoughts concerning her ex-husband. And so when we got to this point in the workshop, she was going, you're joking. You need to, I could accept how he was, or how he is. And this is where this phrase came, fuck it, chuck it. And the interesting thing about this phrase is that the expletive helps encapsulate and, and register the pain, the hurt, the anger, the disappointment, all the emotions 
that are attached to the event. And then in the next breath, chuck it. Whatever. Just let it go. Fuck it, chuck it. It's amazing what can be shifted just in that, those four words. So you may want to try it and see what it does for you. I'm just seeing that somebody's having a problem with the audio. Is that going all right for the moment? Oh, chuck it. What does chuck it mean? Chuck it means throw it away. Throw it away. Chuck like you chuck a ball. Uh, if that makes sense. So just throw it away. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. I love this system. It's excellent. Good. Okay. So we've got security. Oh, Lordy, that's, that's not that one yet. Previous. We've got security, we've got acceptance. The next one is a big one as well. It's our sense of purpose. Our, do we know what our sense of purpose is? Do we know what we're here to be? Do we know what we're here to do? Because if we do, then the future looks after itself. I often think that uh, a sense of purpose and being aware of it is like having a grappling iron. What I mean by... It's, it's sometimes, you know, when you see in, 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 in thrillers, James Bond films, where they'll, they'll put a, throw a hook up and it catches on the wall and then they can climb up because the hook is there stabilizing them. And I think that's what a sense of purpose is like. Um, it, we can pull on it, it's our magnetic north, it's our, our sense of ourself and. and a real fixed sense of where we're going and that if I have time we can go into this more deeply but with this sense of purpose means that we don't have to fret about what's to come because it's there it connects with our destiny it already is predetermining what we're here to, to be doing okay next one then is connection and my suggestion is that the more that we've accepted what has happened, the freer we are to open ourselves up and to make connection. Now, in this one, what we need to be looking at is what and where are we connecting with? Are we connecting with the right tribe? Is this tribe enhancing us? Is this tribe affirming us? Is this tribe reflecting who we are? Or are we with people that are doing us a disservice? Or are we with people who, um, who are, are no longer part of our purpose and where we want to be going? So it's worth being aware of. Who am I giving my energy to? The, the, the Huna people would have that as soon as you make connection, your Akka chords and your mana connect with them and that there's a flow between you and if that flow is positive then it's enhancing and if that flow is not positive then it is wearing and draining you so it's, it's worth taking an evaluation of who am i connecting with am i connect making sufficient connections that enhance me and enhance them and the other element here is connection with place. I mean, where I am in my office here and the window in front of me, there's a beautiful valley that stretches about 10 miles. And on different days, I can see really clearly. And the, the light is different, the sun. and, and, and oh, It is beautiful. And it feeds my eyes and it fuels my soul. And I just feel better. Now, I know that there's people who are living in places which, where they don't have their, their soul needs met. And I just wonder how often do people make the effort to find a place where their soul can connect with nature and that they can get a sense of that ancient energy that comes from place. Or are they too busy hammering away in their lives? working hard at their security in terms of 
income yet yet, that they're not spending time making that sense of connection. Okay. So now the next one is contribution. And here I use the word talents, and I and I use it in in that sort of biblical sense. Where talents are talents are all the abilities, the attributes that we have come into this world with, and the abilities that we have developed, and even many that we have let wither a bit. They're now, we don't use them or activate them as much as we might. And they're still there. They're still part of our repertoire. There is so much more that we could be deploying in how we are making a contribution and how we are serving. And the more we're on our purpose, the more we will know the sorts of contributions we want to make. And this is about knowing that we are making a useful footprint. And that when we look back in our life, uh, there's a lovely line by Mary, Mary Oliver which says, you know, when I die, I don't want to have just vis visited this world. So there's a sense that what I am doing is making a positive difference to the people around me and in that process, therefore, enhancing myself. Okay, so the last one now is that sense of alignment. And for those of you familiar again with the neurological levels, you'll know that that is that feeling of being centered, that you're walking your talk, you're not disappointing yourself, you're living by your values. And should you go off balance, then you're able to correct yourself in a way and in a manner that makes you feel good. We can be most out of kilter with who we are when we just know we are doing the wrong thing in the wrong place with the wrong people, saying the wrong things, even though it's what the people around us want to hear. And I'm just wondering now, as you are viewing your current situation, there might be some of these things that I'm saying here that... Uh, ring larger and bells. And I really like uh, Mary Angela saying what she's saying. It's wonderful to have people who very much agree with you. So thank you very much. So what I'm going to do next now is to, to work with this model and see how it can make a difference with you. So imagine that you have got um, a mixer desk like you have in a, in a, in a sound system. Um, and begin to plot now your sense of, well, yes, yes. You know, if, if Maria Angela is talking about it looks like a mission. Well, if the pursuit of happiness is something that uh, is taken seriously, then connecting up all these elements is a really good way to go about it. Uh, I actually think if you do this, happiness is a byproduct. It's not something that you're, for me, I'm out to um, pursue in and of itself and for itself. Uh, if I can do the other things, I wake up and I feel, you know what, I feel happy. I, do people remember a film called um, Little Big Man? And I had Dustin Hoffman and he'd been... Um, taken by a, a, a Native American tribe and he was being brought up within, within the tribe. And there was a wonderful, wonderful old um, Indian chief whose daily mantra was, it's a good day to die. It's a good day to die. And I often think that um, when I'm on mission, when, I'm, when I am signing off in each of these, and I have that real sense of, well-being, that real sense of connection. If I am plucked off the earth at that moment, I wouldn't put up a fight. There'd be no ripples and there'd be no protest. In that moment, I'm just ready to go. 
And it's because these elements, as I think about it now, it's because these elements have been met for me. So take a moment now and have a look at your, your own profile. Where would you put yourself? And when you do that, you may be noticing which are high, which are low, which are in the middle. You may also be noticing that there may be some that are um, having to compensate for others. So you may have uh, a, an over-reliance on one element that if that was challenged and threatened, then that would be the cause for you to slide down into the other side, the side of depression, the side of dissatisfaction. And this is a way for you to start evaluating what, how, how are you constructing for yourself the the, the elements which will contribute to your sense of well-being. Okay. Now, again, if this was moving and it's not, what I'd ask you to do now, once you've plotted where you are on, on your profile there, just imagine that these are sliding switches, as you know, as you'd see in a sound desk, and begin to move them up and down. Begin to notice what happens inside yourself as you explore what it would be like to increase the level of acceptance. What would it be like if you increased your sense of connection, your sense of security, increased or decreased? So what would it be like if you decreased your sense of alignment? That's an interesting, interesting concept. What would happen if you moved your sense of contribution? So take a moment now to explore. Because just notice, too much can be too much. So, uh, you know, too much acceptance might render a sense of complacency. Um, too much acceptance might um, mean that you totally ex um, forgive everything that happens to you and challenge nothing. Uh, too much connection might mean that you've got a sense potentially of codependency where you your well-being is dependent on their being happy with you. Yes, and yeah, I would agree with that. Um, everyone will have their own level. Everyone will have their own level. In <laughs> There used to be a phrase before ecstasy became a drug that was well known. How much ecstasy can you handle? And my answer was, in Scotland, the answer is not a lot. We're a, we're a Puritan race in Scotland. So for each of us, we need to have our own sense of what is enough as opposed to what's too much. And... To have, for example, too strong a sense of purpose could mean that here's a person that is um, absolutely self-determined, self-focused, who is, is not factoring in people around, who will only agree to anything if it serves his or her purposes, and by and large, could could be a pretty objectionable person to to live with. So it's down to the individual. Uh, I think there is ecology here. I think we have to take in the wider system, and we have to honour and be true to ourselves in the process, which is what makes it a very much um, an idiosyncratic. So Cecile says so. It is the balance who's important. Yeah, I think if what you're saying there, if we will find for ourselves, and you will find it within your own somatic sign-off, that this is what I recognize as happiness. When I get this balance working, I'm happy. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good about myself. I'm feeling good about the world around me. 
my energy is getting positive, it's taking me forward, I'm not being pulled back with what's been, and it's a good day. You wake up in the morning and you go, the world's a good place to be in. And that is entirely down to ourselves as to what we determine. Nice, nice questions. All right. Now, the next thing is as you were looking at shifting your levels up and down the, so it gets to the point where you, it's feeling good for you, the question is then, well, what might you have to do to get there? Do you just have to let go of some old um, favorite dissatisfaction that you'd like to scratch and justify you for staying stuck? Um, or, I mean, I'm just thinking of one in particular, which I've now happily let go of, um, which was bizarre what I was gaining from keeping it. Um, and it, it, it was it was really a, a big case of well if I <coughs> oh excuse me <coughs> you know I'm okay they're not okay deep breath all around <coughs> this could be the nightmare <coughs> um. <coughs> okay, everyone holding their breath. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> right, I think I'm all right. We'll move on. <coughs> oh, God. Okay, so. So the question now is, um, what might you have to do? So have a look at... <laughs> yeah, I know, yay! <laughs> How wonderful. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So have a look and become aware of what you might have to do, what you might have to let go of, what you might have to work more on, and just check out with yourself <coughs> Excuse me. Are you prepared to do that? Are you prepared to put the work in? Are you prepared to take the emotional risk? And um, <laughs> and it's information. So, what I'd like to do now. Hello. <laughs> <coughs> Let's go on to how you can use this. And there's three different exercises that we can be looking at. 